Okay, so um, let's just get right into it, Michael. Um, j- just go ahead and give me your stance on homosexuality, and then I will ask you some questions based on a few scenarios. Certainly, David. Uh, well, you know that I believe in the Bible. I believe it's God's infallible Word, and within the Bible, the pages of God's Word, you find that uh, God condemns homosexuality. Uh, he considers it a sin, an abomination. It's ungodly. It results in the loss of the soul, and therefore, as a behavior, I'm opposed to it because the Bible says so. Okay. Now, you say as a behavior, meaning, so so so. Let me ask you this: Do you believe? The scientific research, and of course we know scientific research can go both ways depending on who's doing the research and who's presenting the evidence. Um, but uh, you, do you believe the scientific research that has come out that says people are born attracted to the same sex? Do you believe that to be true? You know, I, I think that that's a question that's very difficult to answer, but I would say that certain individuals are born prone to certain actions. They're born with certain desires that uh, may or may not be godly, may or may not be acceptable to God. Um, The answer is yes, there are genetic factors. It doesn't excuse the behavior as being morally good, um, but to a certain degree I would say that there is a point in which one is genetically predisposed to being attracted to the same sex. Um, just because of the situation that they're in, their body, and how it works. And and if I if I may, I believe your position is that even though you may be genetically predisposed to being attracted to the same sex, being attracted to a person is not necessarily the sin. I believe that your position is acting on it is where they cross the line. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. I would say that. Okay. So I guess my next question would be... Um, if you think if if you can agree that that sometimes people are genetically predisposed to being attracted to the same sex and you believe that the christian god made them that way um why do you think in your belief system why uh, yahweh would create a person with specific desires yet forbid them to act on those desires it's a very good question. I believe the answer is found throughout the Bible in the, the reasoning behind why we as human beings have sin in the first place. You see, I view homosexuality, as the Bible presents it, as equivalent with any other sin. And by that I mean the behavior itself, not the particular feelings that a person might have. Uh, for example, uh, a certain individual might be predisposed to being an alcoholic because of their genetic makeup. Just because they're an alcoholic doesn't mean they're a sinner. But when they partake of the alcohol to intoxicate themselves, they are sinning. And I believe it's a similar situation with those who are homosexual. When they practice the homosexuality, they're sinning. But just because they're acting that way, it doesn't mean that... Or just because they're they're uh, predisposed to act that way, it doesn't mean they're a sinner. Follow oh, me? I, I, I do. I understand that that's your logic. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with it, but... I, I want to ask you now, you could not force yourself to be with another man. I mean, I'm, of, of, of course you could force yourself, but to live day to day, it would be virtually impossible to force yourself to enjoy being with a man day in, day out, paying the bills, having a mortgage. I mean, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't do that. On your own, right? I mean, I mean, even if I, you know, absolutely said this is you just have to, Michael. You absolutely have to live with a man, call him your boyfriend, kiss him goodnight, you know, make love to him on a regular basis, and this has to be your life partner. You you couldn't do that. Uh, so when we look at how uh, most, I, and and for, for for purposes of argument, let's talk about gay men individually. When we talk about gay men, they really a lot of them couldn't really force themselves to be with a woman. I mean, they could probably once, maybe twice, maybe they did it in teenage years as they were experimenting and growing. But as grown men, you know, completely developed, they they really can't force themselves because it's it doesn't feel natural to them. So what do we say to those gay men that are in the church 
that come to you and say, look, I feel like I've been born gay. I feel like I'm attracted to men. Um, I am completely miserable pretending to be attracted to women. I don't want to be with women. I want a husband. What do you say to them? Do you tell them then don't be with anybody if you can't be with women? Or do you tell them that they have to leave the church if they choose to be with men? I mean, what's what's the what's the church's position on that person's happiness as far as, you know, we're social creatures and we want to pair off just like many animals do, mostly mammals. We want to pair off. We, we, we want to have that life partner. What do you say to someone who's attracted to other men and they want that partner feeling in their life? Do you tell them that they just need to be alone instead of acting on their on their sinful behavior? I tell them that I'm not an authority in the matter, nor is the church, but the Bible is. And he's going to be held accountable to God, not to me, not to anyone else, but he must um, observe what God has taught in his word. And that's what we're all going to be accountable to. And just because we have these feelings, because we have these desires, um, which all desires aren't necessarily sinful, but I believe the word of God clearly shows us that that particular desire uh, is sinful when we fulfill those lusts, when we go after that desire, uh, that is sinful. And so I would say that if he is to um, live in accordance to God's Word, he could not do that, because that's what God's Word says. I mean, it's very clear, the book of Romans chapter 1, saying that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience for what they're doing, and that is lusting after strange flesh, lusting after the same uh, uh, gender, it's just a bold So I would say that. Okay, and now this these these Bible verses don't just say that it's sinful nature. Um, going back to the Old Testament in Leviticus, I believe twenty thirteen specifically, tells us to put to death people who who engage in homosexual behavior. What is your position on that? Is that something we don't do anymore because of the new laws of liberty, the New Testament, the arrival of Jesus? Is that is that the out on that? That passages you're referring to in Leviticus, for example, uh, that talk about uh, the punishment of homosexuality, was written to the Jewish people, and it was for a specific purpose. Christians were never told to kill anybody. Christians are never authorized to do those kinds of things. But the Jews were authorized to do things and were commanded, in fact, to do things for a purpose. And that purpose was to preserve the seed line of Christ. And so it was conducive for uh, the success of that generation and every generation afterwards until Christ would come and then the covenant would be abrogated. Uh, certain passages, such as uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, shows that the, the handwriting of ordinances, the law, if you will, the Mosaic Law was nailed to the cross. So we are not obligated to, we are not authorized to kill anyone for their behavior. In fact, the New Covenant is a covenant of liberty. And so it's freedom to do as you choose in this life, and no one can decide for you what you need to do or tell you what you need to do outside of just showing what the Word of God says. So the homosexual behavior that happened in the Old Testament you're telling me that only Jews were instructed to commit murder on those people. New Testament Christians were never told to kill anyone. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Uh, you know, I wouldn't use the word murder. Uh, murder indicates that it's a lawful, unlawful killing. The, the, there was capital punishment under the old law. There's no question about it. Uh, and now we have the governing authorities, not the church, using capital punishment today for various offenses. Uh, for example, uh, in the book of Romans, chapter 15, it talks about that. Verses 1 through 4, they bear not the sword in vain. Uh, so the, excuse me, chapter 13. But the, the scripture is clear that, no, the church Christians do not have authority to do those kinds of things now. It was interesting that you, you said it wouldn't be considered murder because it would be lawful. I mean, some of the laws, and I, I know we're going to get back on topic to homosexuality. That's really the focus of the conversation, but we've kind of taken this branch for a moment, and, and I want to I wanna talk about it. Just like in, in uh, 1 Samuel 15.3, uh, uh, where he, you know, the, the wiping out of the Amalekites, 
it's it's specifically list kill the infants the nursing children the you know oxen and it 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 goes line by line uh exodus 35 2 says that you're not supposed to work and anyone who is seen working on the sabbath should be put to death i mean homosexuality is kind of lumped on un, lumped under with these with these other things that um it, it just seems kind of silly reasons to 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 kill people i mean I know that it's the Bible and you have to defend it, but it would never fly in, in today's world. I mean, if, if someone wrote a brand new book like this, it would be completely rejected. I think the only reason this thing has any merit is because it's so old, it's antiquated, and people have followed it for so long, but they follow it subjectively. They don't follow all of it. They just follow the parts that fit with their lives. And that, that's one of my problems with general Christianity today. But I do understand what you mean, that that, that large portion of the, the, the orders to kill are in the Old Testament. But the bottom line is the orders came from God to kill homosexuals, regardless if it's Christians, regardless if it's to the Jews. The orders came from the Christian God to kill homosexuals. And the Bible also tells us, that God does not change. So, objectively reading it and logically applying what we know to be scientific method and logic to this book, and if God doesn't change and God wanted homosexuals killed, then he wants them killed now. So I would like to know the difference. If God doesn't change, why aren't we still instructed to kill people that are not biblical? Isn't it because Christ has already come and he's, set up a new covenant for us. In fact, the death of the testator indicates that there is a new covenant, and he has taken away the old covenant to establish the new. And w one thing that we have to recognize is that if we accept God supreme, if we accept him as our standard of authority in all things, there's no problem in recognizing what he did to be his holy and just and righteous right to do so. He had the right to dictate at certain times what should be done and what should not be done. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that Christians were never authorized, were never commanded to do those things. That was for a specific purpose, for a specific time, with a specific group of people, uh, which was the physical, carnal people of Israel, uh, not his spiritual people today, the, uh, the church. And so if you want to say it's an indictment on God, you know, fine. That's that's your view on God. You don't believe He's supreme, so so it fits into that logic. But it's certainly not an indictment or a, a subjectivity, if you will, of the Christian who's reading the Bible from what I believe to be an objective standing. Okay. So God does change. the The coming of Jesus changed His views on what to do with gays. God does not change. He's immutable. He's eternal. And so the attributes that he had during the Old Testament times are the same that they are today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, to today, and tomorrow, the Scripture says. And so we acknowledge that he is the same. However, he has the right to change the covenant. That doesn't mean that he's not immutable because he changes the covenant. Okay, so he, he, he didn't change his mind. He didn't change his mind about it being wrong, but he no longer wants gays to be killed? I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding that part. He doesn't speak uh, concerning the killing of anyone as far as what the Church or Christians are authorized to do. Now, he talks about the government bearing out the sword in vain, and that has to do with punishing evildoers, and it's a very broad statement there. And I suppose from an argument you might say, well, the government may have the right to do that. You know, I don't know. That's a whole other discussion. But the Church does not have that authority in the New Testament and the New Testament is what we're governed by today. Okay, so it's it's the New Testament then. As I said, the Old Testament has been abrogated. It's for our learning. Uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says that it's for our learning, so that through patience we might have uh, hope. And many other scriptures establish that the covenant is, is new. We're not under the Old Covenant anymore. We've been set free from it. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 24, 25, 26, about that area it shows that we've been set free from that schoolmaster, that tutor, which brought us to Christ. And so with the death, with the death of Christ, we have the new covenant established. But Romans one thirty one 
says that homosexuals are worthy of death, and that's New Testament. It's not a direct instruction to kill, but it does say that homosexuals are worthy of death. Yes, I think you need to pay attention to the context there and what it's talking about. It's talking about spiritual condemnation. It's talking about eternal death. Okay. Eternal stuff. Uh, You know, that's, that's a problem I have with apologetics in general. Death means death when it actually means death, but when it sounds a little too harsh to be in the New Testament, then we say it's hyperbole and spiritual death. How do you know the difference? How do you really know unless you're just trying to spin it to fit with the way you believe? How do you really know what the Bible meant? Well, David, it's a little old thing called hermeneutics, how we interpret the Bible. And there are rules of interpretation, and when we look at passages, we have to determine what does this mean, and what does that mean, and how do we know that? And one of those rules of interpretation of hermeneutics is the context and what's being spoken of there. And nowhere in the context does it indicate that Christians can go grab a sword and run somebody through simply because they made a choice to be homosexual. Now, again, and, and, and that's something we, we also need to talk about. You think homosexuality is a choice. You think people are choosing to live this way. I think any action that an individual does, it doesn't matter what the action does, there's free will involved. Whether I get up and get a glass of water, or I go to the store, or I uh, drink alcohol, or I decide to murder someone, whatever I do, it's a choice. And we have to man up to that reality. I, I, I get that, but it's very that's very easy to say for someone like me or you who was born straight. So we are attracted to females. Society accepts that. Churches accept that. We can sit in church next to the person we love and want to be our, our, our life partner, and nobody judges us. But if a gay man is born that way, and he can't sit in the church pew next to the man he loves without being condemned, without the whispering, without the talking, without the backbiting, without preachers telling him he needs to be quote unquote fixed or something like that. And so gays kind of take the brunt of it. It's easy for us to say, well, it's just his behavior. Could you imagine being born in a society that thought it was taboo for you to be attracted to women? You've got these instincts to procreate, you've got these instincts, these these sexual desires, these attractions, and you're not allowed to act on them or else you're going to spend eternity in torture. It, it it's really easy to say, you look, you know, man up and take responsibility, but you've got to realize that you you were born lucky enough that society accepts the person you fell in love with. These men don't have that luxury. David, let, let me put it to you this way. I believe the Bible is God's infallible, perfect word, and that it's the authority in all things pertaining to how I live my life and what I believe. If I opened up the Bible and there was a passage in the Bible that says, you cannot uh, sleep with a woman, you cannot be married to a woman, it is sinful, then I believe that it is my duty not to have sex with a woman, not to get married, if that's what the Bible says. Because yeah. that is our authority. I understand that. And so that, I, that's I, easy I, to say. It's easy to say in a debate that you would do that. However, if you, that was actually your day-to-day life and you were so lonely and you had to hide every time you felt an attraction for another woman or every time you felt attraction for a woman, you had to hide that and push that down, that creates psychological problems. That can lead to suicide and depression, overeating anxiety disorders that can lead to all sorts of other problems pushing your feelings down and not discussing them and not not let not being yourself not being free you become a prisoner in your own body and i think that's the part that you're missing yes you're right every action is of free will and you go and you do that action and that's your choice but what we're not talking about is the inside the psychology of the person and how damaging it is to tell somebody that the way you are at your core is wrong and you need to pretend or at least act like in some form or fashion that you are what we consider to be normal don't be you be what this paper says you should be that's extremely difficult to say to another human David those those kind of Uh, negative consequences might happen in the life of the atheist. It might even happen in the life of the Christian, but that doesn't mean the Word of God isn't true. And the Word of God tells us that He will bear with us. He will help us and provide a way of escape when we're tempted. He'll provide help for us. And that's where faith comes in and belief that God rescues us from sin, and He rescues us 
from evil and from destruction. But I, and I, that regardless of what we're facing, he's there to help us and carry us through it. I, I understand that that logic. I, I get the the basis, but um, I think that that drives a lot of people away from the church. I, I think that the, you know the people that and and I I happen to know people that are gay and they want to be Christians. They argue with me about biblical points. They want to believe. They want to feel that there's a higher power, but they don't want to go to church and be whispered about and made fun of and told by the preacher that they're wrong and that they need to be fixed. So it creates this whole social disorder where they want to just be hermit crabs, stay in their home, but they hang crosses on the walls and they want to pray. And they want to do things for Jesus and God, and they want to go to church on Christmas Day, but then they have the discussion, should we, should we be made fun of, should we deal with the whispering? You know, that that, that creates that internal struggle. And again, it's extremely difficult to tell somebody to be somebody that they're not. And I, I understand where you're coming from. I just, I, I think that that pushes a lot of people away from the church. And someone like me, who's for civil rights, makes me look at this book as a book of oppression. A book of some of, of somebody telling you, you know what? If this is the way you're born, then you have certain rules that we don't have to live by. David, unfortunately, individuals are flawed, and let me explain to you a situation that I went through in a congregation where I was preaching for. Uh, there was uh, an individual there who was known by others to be a homosexual. At least he had a those effeminate traits. Not necessarily that he was practicing homosexuality but that he was assumed to be a homosexual. People were whispering about him, they were laughing at him behind his back, and he got upset, left the church. We went to talk to him, told him that he is welcome with us. We want him there with us. We reprimand those individuals who are making fun of him, who are hurting his feelings, who are acting that way. God wants the homosexual to be saved. He wants them in his church. He wants everyone who has problems, who have, has issues, who has struggles in their lives to be saved. And so this isn't some kind of an endeavor where we're trying to be like Nazis uh, or the Gestapo trying to force homosexuals out of the church. That's not what this is at all. Love is, 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 is available for all individuals. When you say that the Christian God wants homosexuals to be saved, do you mean fixed? Do you I mean say fixed because as an individual, there's nothing wrong with them per se. I would oh, say absolutely. That no, no, no. Now, I've got to challenge you on that point. You say there's nothing wrong with them, but they're born with desires that you say God condemns. So if God is con- condemning the desires that are in their brain, there's something wrong with their brain in your viewpoint. They need to be corrected. David, I'm, I'm born with desires that God condemns. You're born with desires that God condemns. We develop these things because we are born into a sinful world. Maybe because so, a place that's full of sin. but not something as powerful as procreation. Not something as powerful where millions and millions of sperm are being created in your body every day. There is this overwhelming instinct to get rid of that stuff. I mean, we've got this, 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 this overwhelming instinct to mate and procreate. That's huge. Yeah, there, there may be instincts to lie. There may be instincts to steal. There may be instincts to do certain things that, that people wouldn't consider moral. I get that. You're right. Those are just instinctual versus our society. But when you start talking about homosexuals, they are on another level. They are not allowed to experience that sense of partnership, that sense of love, and, and that sense of, of sexual pleasure that straight people are allowed to are allowed to experience within the church. That's a much bigger that's a much bigger problem. I think that the lust of the individual who would call himself a homosexual, the lust of the individual who would call himself a heterosexual or even a pedophile is it, all the same. If it's lust, it's sinful. I don't differentiate between them. And I think an individual who would oppose God in his actions will be held accountable for it, whether he committed a heterosexual sex act that's sinful, homosexual or otherwise. Okay, so, for so right there we've got a contradiction, Michael. 